Hello and welcome everybody. Hi, Kevin. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Content at the Davis Finney Foundation, and you are here at our Living with Parkinson's meetup. Tom is going to lead us today in a really fabulous conversation about, well, I think he is. I don't know where he went. He's going to, um, we're going to talk about love and relationships and care partnering and all of that. So what I would love to start with, as we usually do, is just, I'm going to call on you and we'll go around real quick for those of us uh, who are new in the audience to just let people know who you are and why you are a part of this fabulous panel that we get to meet with every month. So uh, Doug, you're the first on my screen. I'm sorry, I was tuned out. Are okay. we just introducing ourselves? Just say hi, who you are, where you're from, and then how you got involved in this panel. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Reed. I uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, about 13 years ago and was exhibiting symptoms for two to three years before that. Had DBS uh, just over three years ago, and I'm doing a lot better. I volunteer at the Davis Finney Foundation. I live only about 15 minutes away. And so through that, I became part of this group, which I'm happy to be a part of. Thanks, Doug. We love having you, and we love having you so close to the office. Kevin. <clears throat> hey, everyone. I'm Kevin Kwok. I'm also dialing in here from Boulder. Um, I've been living with Parkinson's for about 14 years. I'm on the board of the Davis Finney Foundation, and I think I've been on this council since the onset of it several years ago. Yeah, I think we're going one of my favorite years. things that I do. Thanks, Kevin. Kat. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kat Hill, and I'm currently calling in from uh, the Palm Desert area in Southern California. And let's see, I've had Parkinson's. I've been diagnosed for over eight years, probably been uh, with me longer than that, like most of you. And um, I am a retired nurse practitioner and midwife and really honored to be a part of this group since its inception. So really happy to be here. Thanks, Kat. Robin. Hey, everybody. I'm Robin Morades. Diagnosed in 2015 at the age of 46, but knowing the constellation of symptoms, my symptoms date back to 2002, 2003. So I've been living with it for a really long time. And I got involved with the panel because I became friends with Amy, who was on the panel. And she had done that for a couple of years and decided she wanted to step aside and she nominated me. So I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, Robin. Amber. Hi, I'm Amber. I'm in El Paso, Texas. I've been living with Parkinson's for, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Math, I think like eight years. Um, I started sharing my story on TikTok and it introduced me to some wonderful people. Um, and actually Kevin introduced me to the Davis Finney Foundation and that's how I got involved with the panel. Thanks, Amber. Hey, Great having you. Brian. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm in Huntington Beach uh, area in Southern California. Uh, I've had Parkinson's for 12 years uh, and have been working with the foundation for uh, five or six. I don't know, maybe seven. Uh, we were the second group. My wife and I were the second group of ambassadors brought in uh, when there was just seven or eight of us before there were, what are there now, 60? 89. 80. Something yeah, crazy. It's growing, but it's beautifully growing. So anyway, um, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. All right, Tom, I'm going to let you take it away, introduce yourself, and then you go for it. I'm going to step aside and let you do it. Well, okay. Thanks. Thanks much, Mel. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, esteemed colleagues. It's good to be back with you guys. I've been, uh, I've been delinquent for a while. We've been doing a little bit of traveling, my wife and I, my care partner and I, <laughs> the, the love of my life and I so have been doing some fun stuff. Anyway, um, today we wanted to talk about uh, love, really, and and love in the form of relationships, primarily uh, with our, our our care partners, if we have care partners, and just explore some of the uh, things that go on there, and and uh, what 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 kind of impact Parkinson's has on both our the relationship as well as the people um, 
that, you know, just our family and friends and, and whatever. So anyway, you know, love conjures up an array of uh, interpretations and meanings and definitions. I think the Greeks have uh, had four words they use to describe love, four different kinds of love, according to the Greeks, and they're, they're good guys. Um, you know, it's even been defined as a drug by troubadours and, and poets for that matter. And today, I think, you know, we all see love as sometimes it's messy and sometimes it's complicated and, and sometimes it's just difficult. But at the end of the day, I think we all enjoy the, uh, the benefits we get from being in a relationship and, and being in love and that type of thing. So it's not really, this isn't really about intimacy. This is just about how, how the word love fits with between Parkinson's and, and uh, relationships. And again, on the heels of Valentine's Day, we thought this was kind of appropriate, a day dedicated to celebrating that emotion. So we wanna take a look at how it impacts the relationships with the ones we love, spouses, significant others, kids, family, friends, neighbors, and of course, care partners. And then we also wanna explore how people who don't have a care partner deal with, with things like that. So um, again, my name is Tom Polizzi. I was diagnosed in 2008. So it's been a number of years I've been playing around with Parkinson's. I was 48 years old at the time and, and my kids were home. They were rel relatively, they were just starting college about that age, end of high school, being in college. And it had all kinds of uh, impacts on our relationship with them, myself and my wife, and nothing bad. It was just uh, difficult. You know, it's, it's something we had to navigate through. And my kids are older now. We're all 16 years older. And my wife and I are still together, still quite happy. And I know I'm, I'm a bigger pain in her butt than I ever was before, but we're not going to talk about that. So anyway, um, I think uh, I've seen a lot of different situations arise from Parkinson's and its impact between people. Uh, husbands and wives primarily and, and uh, boyfriends and girlfriends, et cetera. But I've also seen that hasn't been good, but I've seen so many more that have been very good. So in other words, it might've started out not so good, but it ended up actually turning a corner and becoming good for everybody involved. So um, I think it, with that, I wanna go ahead and, and just open the floor up. I asked uh, the folks that are on this call today that are leading this call to think about it and, uh, Consider how Parkinson's not only challenges those living with it, but those who we share our love with. So if anybody'd like to take it from there, that'd be great. To jump in, I, I see somebody asked a question in the chat box. It says, how do you deal with care partners who think you're gonna get better if you just blank more, like do more, walk more, probably something like that. Um, and I think, uh, so I have, the, greatest care partner in the world. She passed away two years ago. But the way we worked things out when I was first diagnosed was we, at first it took me a while to understand what the symptoms were, uh, you know, what was Parkinson's and what was just getting older or whatnot. But as I found things, I found that the more we dialogued about it, instead of just kind of trudging through it, the better we were. So um, I think when you get to a question like that, it's, you know, listen to them, hear them out and, and, try it, don't, I think our first impulse is no, because as Parkinson's, it's, I think, at least with me, I was more bullheaded and like, no, I can manage this myself kind of thing. But then listen to them and, and see if it works out and touch touch base with them again. Don't just necessarily blow it off because it's a partnership. Uh, and, and that's how it works as a partnership as you work through it together. Uh, so that's my input. Tom, I'll add something here. Uh, my mother also has Parkinson's and we were recently, her health took a, a steep decline recently and I was talking with my brother about it and he said, I just don't understand. And what he was questioning was the variability of the symptoms, even though I've been diagnosed since 2015 and my mom's been diagnosed since about 2018, he just didn't understand. He said, shouldn't it be more like this? And I said, no, and I used it as an opportunity for education. I suggested that he watch some old webinars here where we talk about the variability of symptoms day to day, hour to hour, and that there's no real explanation as to why things, you're, why you're having a good day, why you're having a bad day, why you're having a good five minutes, or why you're having a bad five minutes. So it is an opportunity for education. That's all I'll say there. Yeah, I know I, I have that similar experience that Brian that you brought up. 
about, uh, and I've had that with my family. And uh, again, people that, that I love dearly. And for the longest time, they kept asking, well, when are you going to get better? And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> yesterday, yesterday I was better than today. And tomorrow I'll be, today will be better than yesterday, and et cetera. So that, that's a good point. And using that as an opportunity to educate people on, uh, on what, what, how Parkinson's goes. So, and we all know how, how different it is for everybody else. Anybody mm -hmm. else got something they want to add? Kevin had some. Yeah, I like to respond. For before we even go on, I first want to say thank you to the people that are care partners, because you have the hardest job in the world. We as patients feel like Parkinson's hard, but we're just trying to understand day-to-day -day surviving, and we're expecting people like you to read our mind. Yeah. It's so impossible to do that if we don't even know how we're going to be day to day. So anyway, I wanted to start with that. I'm a guy that's actually messed up a couple of care partners in my life. <laughs> you know, I've been divorced. Uh, I've, I actually pushed one of my partners away in the beginning when I was still trying to be macho with having dealing with Parkinson. And, and I think if I were to play it back and rewind, I would do a lot of things very differently. I, I think today I'm a much more humble guy than I was when I first was diagnosed and I was sort of trying to be Superman. Uh, I'm lucky in the fact that I have found a, a great care partner today, but I've also learned a lot of the lessons along the way that I hope we'll discuss in the course of this call today. Thanks, Kevin. So, Kat? Yeah, I just I, I just want to echo a little bit about um, the people that we love the most sometimes are the easiest to take out some of our frustrations with. And, and I think we need to um, remember that. And I think that they can't be inside our heads, just like Kevin said, they can't read our minds. And so I love the idea of inviting them to share in information gathering and knowledge building and um, and having it not just be me communicating directly to them the information. I think it's safe and more comfortable sometimes for them to get the information even from outside sources and digest it at will. And then and then also making time to talk about it. I know for me, I don't want to talk about it a lot. I don't want to talk about it over dinner. I don't want it to be the focus of my interaction with my adult children. Um, and on the other side of that, I think we have a responsibility to communicate in times where we're not feeling frustrated or overwhelmed about how we're doing. And so giving them the information that they need to feel like they're informed too is important. And yes. the issue of communication is probably one of the most complex things you bring up. Mm -hmm. Because I find that as I progress, my ability to articulate words, even to hold the conversation where I'm getting my point across becomes more challenged. And oftentimes what, what's happening for me is I withdraw. You get into a confrontational conversation and you want to get your points in to try to explain what's going on. And instead you just sort of sit there and just absorb it. That is not effective communication. And I'm really guilty of not saying what I feel in a non-emotional way. And you can't hold your partner accountable if they don't know what you're thinking but it's it's a very the, the issue as we progress with park it's is it's hard to get words out it's impossible to type it's, it's just really challenging yeah thanks kevin i i, I agree with that it's um you know, I, I'm, I'm slower to get out of the car. So, you know, my wife will get out and she'll take off for wherever, wherever it is we're going. And I'm always lagging behind. We'll go for walks and I'm always lagging way behind. All kinds of things like that, that, that we deal with. 
Um, there's the conversations like you pointed out where we, we start talking to each other and I, I get distracted easily or I get uh, confused easily. And, and so that it, it's, it's got a lot of challenges. I think uh, on the other side of the coin, it's, um, it, I think it's brought us closer together in a way that we didn't anticipate we would become. So and that, that's been, I, I guess, in a way beneficial, but it's brought me closer together with a lot of people that, like this group, for example, who I didn't even know prior to that. And then that, that's, that's also opened a lot of doors. So I think uh, as far as relationships go, it, it's easy to, to love others that, have, that, that are like us. And I think it's uh, been more important for me to be able to share that love for, for people like, like us with people that don't have Parkinson's to help them understand you know, what, what we go through it to, uh, to uh, get through the day. So what other comments we have? And then I'd like to, to switch it over to uh, talking more about the people, asking the people that don't have care partners, what, if they have some, some points they'd like to deliver, so. Anything else? Get Heather, she's got her hand raised. Oh, does she? I'm sorry, I can't see. Before you switch topics, being and lagging behind, hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, I don't know how everybody gets every, everywhere on time. I started off two hours earlier and all of a sudden meds went off. I was completely frozen, literally like a stone, thus the dystonia. And then I fell in the shower and I could not get moving no matter how hard I tried. I've been looking forward oh. to this forever. I love talking about anything with you all. And I was so upset that I had to calm down and use some meditation techniques before I got online to, um, to calm myself. And I'm not hurt at all, just my ego. So what I wanted to add to what you were just saying, though, it is imperative that we recognize at times that, quote unquote, I am the monster. Before I get the torches coming after me and the pitchforks, I'm not saying everybody with Parkinson's is a monster. I'm saying Parkinson's itself hurts everyone around, just like being a werewolf. We cannot predict it. We cannot always control it. We can do our best to communicate. And please do try not to take things personally if you're a care partner. We love you, we need you. It is a, is a relationship that is based on trust and we all deserve dignity in this process. And I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. If you love someone with Parkinson's, if you're around someone with Parkinson's, we know that you take a hit too. We're all acknowledging that. And I just wanna say thank you so much. I just wanna add that to the discussion. Thank you for letting me talk. Thanks, Heather. That's awesome, like always. Um, I, I wanted to fit along with what you and uh, Kevin were saying uh, and with the care partner and the communication um, and how sometimes we really expect them to read our mind. Um, I think also as the symptoms become more of a reality, they're trying to figure out when to help and when not to help. I, I, I remember when the word finding first got difficult, Lily would jump in right away with the word she thought I was going for. Uh, and that frustrated me even more because I wanted to work through it a little bit. You're smiling, Tom, like you recognize that one. Um, or, or the uh, walking uh, across the street and, and um, I'm going slower and, and she wants to help. So there's times where you don't want the help, like you want to work through it to get a little bit better. And, and there's times like I wanted to try to find the word. I didn't want to be enabled uh, or I wanted to walk even though it was difficult i needed to feel feel it my own so it was a lot of back and forth in communicating like you know that really didn't work or i need to i need time to find it myself this time uh and then other times it's like why aren't you there you know so it's always a, an effort of communication i think that's the biggest word uh to with care partners comes communication and if we shut down like we often do and don't tell them what they need to do to be there better uh, we're we're losing our care partner. So it's really essential for us to find that. And, and I know now being single because she died two years ago and, and trying to date it's or work with family who doesn't know it, it's insane. They don't understand it at all. Uh, and I don't know how to begin to educate that, but um, I, I think, you know, there's gotta be a resource that they can get to that's easy to synthesize, but all our symptoms are so diff different. I don't know how to do that. Hey, Tom, someone put in the chat something related to what Brian was just saying. Uh, this was some while ago that they put in the chat. How do I, you know, my care partner helping versus controlling all my actions and kind of how do I navigate that? 
And I'm a big one for not only have the conversation, but try to make it fun to the extent you can and not to take it personal. So I'm a big one for having a code word, a stupid code word like pineapple, you know, to just so that everybody knows this code word signifies something. It means I just need help right now. I feel like you're controlling me. You know, if someone's, you know, kind of in your business and you go, hey, pineapple, you know, it's it doesn't get as personal as stop trying to control me. So I'm all for like strategies that you can have a serious conversation, but you can bring some levity into the delivery of how you guys are doing it. And if you've, if you've been together a while, you're going to know your pitfalls, you're going to know your booby traps. And so you just try to sidestep those with some strategies like that. I am. I jump in and add to that, just what you added at the end. Sorry, Kevin, but laugh about it as much as possible together. Yes. One night my tremor was really bad in, in bed. I have a leg tremor and my wife said, oh gosh, it's like one of those cheap hotels where you put a quarter and you get a massage. <laughs> you know, you laugh at these things. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Have any of you seen the movie Love and Other Drugs? Yeah. It's the story of Anne Hathaway, who's a young onset parky, and, and her uh, significant other, Jake, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Chill and all. And there's one scene where he, he's at a support group meeting asking another spouse any tips. And that that husband says, run away, get as far away as you can. And I'm so glad that the real caregivers in our lives don't take that attitude. Um they're the ones that actually don't run away. They actually find a way to be there to support you. Uh, but that was one of the very poignant movie moments in that movie, which made me really think about what it takes to be a good care provider. Um, I often get asked this question, where do you find them? You know, what, 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 what dating app did you use to find my you know, my current life partner. And, and I sort of laugh because, it, you know, when I was going through my uh, early periods of divorce, I went to my neurologist and I said to her, am I going through impulse control issues by wanting to be divorced? And her comment to me was, well, what are you afraid of in divorce? And my comment was, well, I don't want to die getting old alone. And she just started cracking up in front of me, laughing. She goes, you're the last person in the world that I thought, that I think of as being alone, which kind of gave me relief. It's a relief that we're, we are actually pretty interesting people once you get <laughs> beyond some of our, our quirkiness. You know, we're empathetic. We see life in a very different way. Uh, but I'm just curious to hear from others where you find your your partners in life. Well, I'll go. Um, I was divorced shortly after my diagnosis. And um, I guess to back up, Mel interviewed me on Valentine's Day, which I mistakenly apparently referred to as Singles Awareness Day when I was watching local news yesterday. And turns out February 15th is Singles Awareness Day. So I thought it was a joke. And apparently there's a real thing. But um, after the interview, or actually yesterday, I got a Facebook message from a stranger and turns out he was a similar case young onset who had been divorced or separated from his partner and he asked me on messenger if I thought I'd ever date again was I looking for love and I responded that after my divorce and things had calmed down in my life I went out on dating sites and it was difficult to navigate the whole Parkinson's thing for a while. I had in my profile that was straightforward and that scared some people away and I took it out and I would go on dates and I'd have to immediately disclose that I had Parkinson's and it just was awkward. 
But I responded to the guy and said, yeah, I'd love to find love again, but I have a feeling it's going to be, and I want, I want it to happen organically, just meeting someone, but I have a feeling it will be someone in the Parkinson's community if I find love again. I'm not limiting it to that, but that's one of my largest social outlets. These hey, days. Doug, what's going on? <laughs> Doug, do you want me to flash your phone number up there? <laughs> <laughs> hey, lady. Oh, man. One oh, eight hundred oh, Parkinson's and single. <laughs> well, and I, I'll chime in on the other end of the spectrum. What Kevin was talking about too. Um, I sort of represent the other end of the spectrum, where when you were talking about in that movie, when the guy says, "Run away, run away as fast as you can," that's what my husband did. And um, he did it very systematically. He planned for a long time. I don't talk about it a lot because it's hard not to sound petulant about it, but it was a direct result of my diagnosis. He said some things to friends and family member that confirmed my suspicions, but he planned, He, you know, and he left me for another woman about a year and a half after my diagnosis. And the thing is, is that having a partner like that should be indicative of that alone should tell you the state of my marriage, right? And that it was really good that um, he left when he did. And it allowed me to find a really generous, loving, kind man. And that's who I'm with today. And we travel the world and we toast our exes when we're at, you know, these fabulous venues because we wouldn't be here but for their leaving. And I guess what I want to say about that is that I know that there's people out in the listening audience that have had that experience. And, you know, you're not alone in that. Um, I was right on the heels of having actually been supporting my husband single handedly with a business opportunity that he had for a couple of years. And um, it was really devastating to me at the time. And then my life improved a thousandfold, not having him in my life. Really, it's like we say sometimes in recovery, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And my life just improved a thousandfold. And so that's out there too as a thing that happens. I just wanted to put it out there and just to know that you're not alone. I did want to add to what Robin said, that what seems like an ending could be a beginning. We are not in charge. We cannot see the future. At least most of us can't. Um, I'm not an oracle. I have no idea and I have very little control. So what Robin just said about, you know, feeling that devastation, that loss and that grief is very real. However, what is next? What's, what's there? You know, there might be something else there. So just stay open. Yeah, I, I do know a number of people that I've met over the years that that uh, split up as a result of having Parkinson's diagnosis. And then, but a lot of those people, when I had, by the time I met them, they had united with another person with Parkinson's. And I thought, well, that's, I thought that was really kind of cool. And uh, they're still together today and, and things have gone well. And Robin, I'm so happy to hear you. I'm happy your, your story has such a good ending. Yeah. I think it, it deservedly so, but and I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of us maybe lose friends as well. And I think that's happened to each one of us, I'm sure. Friends that don't want to just don't want to deal with the situation. And, and you know, you look at that and you say, that's probably a good thing because, uh, you know, if, if, it, if, if they can't figure this out and I, I can't help them figure it out, you know, that's that's going to be a lot of wasted energy. So. So, so it happens, I think, a little bit to all of us. Although, in the deeper the love, of course, the deeper the the uh, the cuts and bruises in that. So, somebody else had the hand up. I think. Did I miss something? One thing I, I, I would add: it's not necessarily the immediate care partner, but um, I've talked with a number of people with Parkinson's, and and it's the love of family and trying to get family to understand things at the same time and it's a huge communication process because you don't want to sound like well I do that because of Parkinson's so that's my blame 
uh, that's where I assign all the blame. It's, it's, you know, that's a factor of it, but I'm still responsible for my choices. But to have those conversations or have them be willing to have those conversations and understand that, you know, there's the, the side effect of the, uh, the depression or there's a side effect of uh, tremors sometimes, or not the tremors, the, um, the word that I can't find when um, it's kinesios. Uh, explaining what those are and things, um, or, or just over explaining. So it's a balancing act all of itself. Because um, I found after Lily died, my family all said, we'll help take care of him. And here we are a, a year later, and I barely speak with any of them. They, It was too much. So I'm trying to figure out that balance. So that's a really hard thing that I think many of us can relate to, even if you have kids and stuff too. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's some really good points there, Brian. I know with my kids, they're they're older now. My son just got married, and and you know they're they're trying to start out on their lives, and I don't want them to keep always having to look over their shoulder to make sure I'm okay. And you know, you you get that feeling as well. You don't want to be a burden on those people that that you love as well. So that that's always kind of difficult. So, Kat, I also I think want to make a shout out to those of us that have chosen family and and maybe not family of origin and the expectation that um that it is even our children's responsibility to care for us as we age and and some of some of what I feel very strongly about having been a nurse and having been the one taking care of people is that I really don't want my family to have to do everything for me and so I'm already starting to explore some, some ways that maybe people can come into the house, maybe trade room and board for um, helping do some tasks and some care for me, um, setting up my world. I, I don't know how that's going to look because right now, as you know, I'm living in an Airstream trailer, but maybe a caregiver could live on an Airstream trailer and come in and help with some of the tasks. And I, and I think talking we're back to the looping around about communication i think that that this country doesn't do a very good job for any of us about talking about death and dying about aging um and i think we need to have those conversations no matter whether we have parkinson's or not you know we're all aging we're all getting older um for those of us with care partners for those of us without those of us with kids those of us without i think it's our reality and and starting to think about what we want as human beings individually and how can we help build that um i'm loving the chat thread i, I i'll look for a campground we can all bring our campers we'll pitch in, you know, for PT and OT and, you know, I, I mean, I love the idea, but I think we have to start thinking outside of the box and um, we're not alone in that, not just us who suffer with Parkinson's you know, or suffer, those of us who have Parkinson's. So that's my two cents. An interesting thing um, you brought up, you started to talk about, um, you know, the family that's not necessarily family. And, and recently I reached out to someone when I was having a tough time, just expecting to get an answer towards something I was looking for. And that person brought in a community of people and it was overwhelmingly uh, amazing. And, and I learned that, you know, you have a community, you have a family, not necessarily a cat, like you were saying, not necessarily the biological family. Um, and along those same lines and along what somebody was asking in the chat, one thing I'm thinking of doing, because I, I don't want to write off my family, I want to help them navigate this, but I don't explain things well because I don't have the organized brain that I used to have. So what I'm doing is I'm going to start a website or a blog type thing, but where I can just kind of put up, you know, here's different symptoms and a really quick thing on uh, how it is with me and then links to things to find out more if they want. Then at least they can get a quick breakdown and it's up to them to at least start to get immersed rather than throw them a whole bunch of, you know, go to this or listen to this and it's an hour long. I find if they can't absorb it within a minute, they're bored. Uh, so that's just a thought that I have that might answer that question in the chat, but it's always a complicated process, especially with us. 
Well, and Kat brings up also an interesting point that we talked about by email as we were discussing this. There's, you know, family of choice, friends, employers, neighbors, um, lots of people around, and you might be surprised where you're going to get the support. It might not be somewhere that you originally thought of. Um, I was in the closet for a very long time with my employer, and my employer's been incredibly supportive, and now my employer knows. And, um, and incredibly supportive. And the other thing that's important is, I always say this, I, I've repeated this a lot, but I'll say it again. Um, one of the best determinants of outcomes and quality of life is how someone answers the question, I feel lonely, true or false. It's imperative that we have these social relationships for our quality of life and our long-term, everybody, Everybody on the planet, their long-term outcome is death, right? Everybody's long-term outcome is death. It's how you go on the way there. And uh, relationships make all the difference in that quality of life. So true. You know, we're not meant to be alone on this, in this phase of our existence. So, right. you know, what, whatever you can do to mitigate that, by, by all means. Heather, you had, you had mentioned something that you wanted to bring up. I, I don't, I think I saw yeah. it as a... Okay. I want to echo the common theme that I've been hearing for years is that they just don't understand. I've said it. Other people have said it. Um, I wrote a, something about the gift or the poison of having Parkinson's. And I just want to repeat for the record, I've said this before, and you know, we've talked, we've all talked about this. Um, I didn't understand Parkinson's before I had it. I still don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. It is mercurial. It is insanity. I call it the werewolf. I never know when it's coming. I couldn't walk to the computer from the next room 20 minutes ago. And now I'm completely on. Welcome to medication. I mean, it is, it, it's kind of a, it's like being incredibly bipolar physically. And then your brain goes offline too. And then people start to, um, well, they give you all these diagnoses. You know, I've been called all sorts of things. Everything from a C and next Tuesday to bipolar to, you know, all kinds of things. That's Parkinson's because that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. And it's also true that I have a lot to answer for and to make amends for aside from Parkinson's. We're human beings with a chemical, you know, melange going on. Like who knows what's going to happen next? That's the fun part. And we're mixing it up together. We're bumping into each other and we're going to make mistakes. And that's okay too. Because the people who really love you are going to stick around to see what's coming next. And if they don't, if you feel betrayed or abandoned and you're really listening here today, I want to remind you what you're seeing is the capacity of others and your capacity. We're all shining, you know, we're all reflecting each other with masks on. We love to think that we're a certain thing, but really we're a lot of things. We love to point out, oh, look over there, the narcissist, or look over there, the bad guy. We're sometimes the bad guy or the narcissist or whatever. Pain makes people self-absorbed and that's okay too. I just want to add all that into the mix as we're talking about relationships and all this stuff and back to the community. Um, we do have someone talking about adaptive housing. And boy, it is a vision of mine to end up there someday. So that's all I wanted to say for that. Thanks. Good, good comments. Great comments, Heather. We so appreciate you and your insight. You so, know, go ahead, Kevin. One of the things I did with Jen early on in our courtship was I, I brought Jen to a couple of events that were Parkinson's related, just sort of as a, see what you're gonna get. So I, the first one I brought her to was a Parkinson's ski week in Brackenridge, where there were people like me who were still able to ski on regular skis all the way to people in wheelchairs. And we were all housed in this lodge and I invited her to come out and spend the night with us. And she could hear it through the course of the night, all these people going through REM sleep, fighting out their war, their, their battles. She could see the range of all of us. And at the end, I said to her, so now that you've seen this, do you still want to stay together? 
And she said, are you trying to scare me off? And I said, yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> but it really is effective. You know, bring your loved ones to, to World Park and say, bring them to your support group meeting and you'll get a flavor for whether or not they gravitate to us. Kevin, you bring up such a good point. My care partner and I are going to Barcelona to the World Parkinson's Congress. <laughs> Jen's and then and we're we'll riding our bike. Together. Then we're riding our bike from Normandy to Paris. <laughs> are you ready? Really? Yes. Yes, That's we not are. <laughs> so, yeah, we like bike vacations. There's someone else around here that likes bike vacations too. Davis Finney. <laughs> He's done about what? What do you win? 320 races in the 80s and 90s alone? Yep. Yep. Two tours. Like what the heck? He still the, he has more stage wins than any other writer, any other American writer. I believe Amazing. that's the record. That I, can't, I can't even ride. I never could really ride very well. I still can't. Well, let me invite you all to Boulder, May 20th, to ride the Tour de Victory. So uh, that's a great <laughs> event. Very cool. I was worried that because I didn't like to ride bikes, that I wouldn't be accepted as an ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful that I can do other things, but I've never been a cyclist, so. I'm glad that wasn't a requirement. <laughs> yeah, good, Amber, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a great thing to try for those of you that don't like bikes, or for me, the balance was difficult. The recumbent bike is amazing. Uh, and, and I rode that last year at the Tour de Victory. It was my first tour. Um, and, and it was kind of funny because I hadn't ridden in about a year uh, and uh, had a recent car accident, so I had bad knees. And we start out, Tom and I are together. And next thing I know, like 25 people passed me and there was only 25 people doing the, what was it? 10K or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I just got the second wind or something. I passed everybody uh, and made it because the recumbent, you're more built to kind of go at whatever hill or non-hill type thing and keep moving. And I think that's what kept me stronger. Whereas on the bike, you know, they pedal really hard and then they break a little and so it's a lot harder. I just find the recumbent with my Parkinson's so much easier. I don't have to worry about the balance. I can use my legs more. Uh, I can use my hips more. And that enacts muscles that are not getting a lot of attention with the walking. So um, try the recumbent if you haven't. Uh, yeah. it, it is amazing. I, I love mine. There's also Be virtual riding, uh, Brian. I, yeah. I know Tom leads the class. And there's an upcoming seven day event in March called the Wahooligan Tour, <laughs> which is a virtual ride where 3,000 of us from around the world all ride together. Wahooligan, what do you call us? Wahooligan. Wahooligan. Wah Wah through Wahoo. Oh, okay. It used to be called the Tour of Suffer Landria. <laughs> So well, that's the one where they do it. it's a big fundraiser for Parkinson's uh, Davis yeah, Foundation. It's, it's for the, for the, the Davis City Foundation, our la our largest fundraiser. Yeah. Yeah, I met I a guy who was a high, I guess they're called a knight or something like that when they get way up there and suffer landia because they've raised a lot of money. Hmm. I have something that I'd like to ask some of the panelists. I was talking to Mel about it before we went on the show live, which is that. I can feel that I feel rather defended about the fact that I have a partner, but right now I don't really have a care partner. And I'm sort of afraid of crossing that threshold, what it says about me. I feel like I'm fiercely independent and I, you know, I'm afraid of like the progression of the disease. There's no other way to say it. And so I'm curious from people who have kind of crossed that threshold, what advice you know, you give or what reflection you have. I mean, what's weird about Parkinson's is that in a way it is so slow. It's like a turtle running a race. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, when am I going to cross that invisible line? You know, will it take me a long time to cross that invisible line? Uh, I'm with you on that. I actually, so I'm single, like extremely single, have been for over a decade. I have my kids, but they're barely entering teenage years. Um, and I feel like even with my parents, I have a very supportive family. 
Um, I'm Hispanic, so my entire family lives here and are all very willing to jump in and help, but I'm very, I feel like I need to show, like, I can do it on my own. Like, don't help me. But then there's times where I'm like, why isn't anybody helping me? <laughs> so I am on both sides of the coin. I'm like, don't pity me. Don't look at me like that. I can do it on my own. And then I'm like, why aren't you helping me? Pay attention to me. Uh, so I am interested to know how you, how you allow people to help you out when you need it. Cause that's a big struggle for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add, except that I'm going to come back to the communication piece that I'm, I'm exactly like you, Amber, <laughs> and I have a care partner. I'm like, don't, I've got this. Don't tell me I can't do this. And I'm, I, we, Ken and I just had this just before I came down here for this call. So I wish you were on here. I'm like, I'm so sorry, honey. I was really nasty to you. But anyway, um, I, I don't have the answer to that, except that when I'm not in that moment, I have to have a a, a commute uh, a a conversation can i promise my care partner can i promise to ask you for help when i need it will you promise not to just automatically offer it's the same thing with finishing my sentences or um problem solving when he can tell i'm having trouble with something functionally or with my hands I want so badly to continue doing it as long as I can. And so I don't know about you, Amber, but it would help. It helps me to like say, mom, dad, cousins, kids, please know I promise to ask when I'm ready. But then we have to promise to ask, Amber. That, so I challenge the problem. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's mine too. I hear you. But then we've got to do it, though. We got to do it, sister. So those are excellent points. Good, good, uh, good uh, path on the on the topic here. I think um, that that's uh, it's it's important. I think also that the love go two ways, right? From you know our, we see that come from our care partners, and it's it's good for us to return that to our relationships. So, for example, my wife loves to travel, and uh, it's getting harder and harder for me to travel. And there's times when. Um, she wants to go places that I'm not necessarily interested in going to. So she, uh, her and my daughter get together and they go to those places, which has been really good. And they, they worry about leaving me alone, but I'm not really alone here. I mean, I got neighbors around. I have lots of, I've got a great network here locally for me, but I, I, I definitely never want to stand in the way of her, my wife, getting the things she needs still out of life, you know, and that's, it's been like that since day one in our relationship. So I think that's, that's real important to, to do that as well as with uh, others in that relationship network to allow them the, the freedom and flexibility to keep themselves whole as well. So I see myself as a care partner in that direction. Another thought that popped into mind and this might help Amber, I'm not sure because I, I find when I'm in a support group for Parkinson's, uh, especially if I find a young onset, I can talk about these things and I can hear what other people are doing uh, and get some really good ideas. It's harder to find that, but um, I, I think when you get a really good support group, you're you're verbalizing your issues at least to somebody and you're starting to find a way to maybe bring it to your loved ones. Uh, and, and you know maybe it's just sharing with them, hey, I had the struggle and here's how I worked through it. Don't need your help. I just want you to know, here's how it's going. So if it becomes a problem, you know, um, just just a random thought that popped in my head. Anyway, Any, anybody else? Kevin and Heather have their hands raised. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't see the hand thing myself. The top of my screen disappears. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, the the way I envision our life right now is first of all. We're, we're, we've got a lot of years left, and this this journey is not it's 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 not like um, um, the way the stock market works, where you have quarterly earnings and you have to hit marks. We've got decades to think about, Robin. You're part of that. It moves really slow. Well, sometimes you blink and it goes dramatically different faster than you realize. 
and and I think it's, that's what happened to my mom. Yeah, that that's kind of how I I was experiencing it. You know, the first decade, I tried to deny the need for help at all. So I would not let my spouse come with me to appointments. I, I would insist on doing everything. I was not going to be the one pushed in a wheelchair 20 years down the road with my, that my last, my ex uh, in there. But that to me was my fault. And I think when I commented earlier about ruining a relationship, the ego pride thing really got in the way. So there, there is an art to accepting help, Amber, uh, that, that I, I'm starting to understand and really appreciate. And the fact that I have a partner today that can actually predict it, She's gotten to know me well enough to know when to back off. I mean, very simple things like she'll ask me a question. And I'll be so busy doing one thing that I hear the question, but I don't answer. You, you know, I, I get this pregnant pause that may last minutes. And then I'll come back to it. By, and by then, you know, my partner's thinking, well, I'm just being really rude, or I didn't hear it at all. But it's, the processing time takes longer. And, and I sense that as, as the years go by, that's going to get more and more uh, pronounced. So I think that we owe today with those of us that are either trying to get partners or have a good partnership is to communicate that that we're not going to get better, but we are going to have more and more of these episodes. I, I don't quite know how to do that, uh, but, it, but it's something that's, that I'm ruminating over quite a bit. Thanks, Kevin. Heather, was your a hand up? A rather beautiful part of what Kevin just said is that we've all been so humbled. Um, I don't know if I can speak for anyone else, but I can tell you that I had a hell of a lot more swagger and a lot more cockiness and a lot more bravado and ego first when I first started this. I'm like, I'm going to be an expert in Parkinson's. Look at me, I'm working out. I can beat this, this is easy. And then shit got real. And now I'm kind of like, whoa, when I love somebody, it is for keeps and it is for real. Like, I don't waste my time, which is going like this on anything that's not based in what I see as truth. And I say what I see as truth because truth is obviously highly subjective. But at the same time, that love is coming mirrored from all about. We have so much support around us if we just know where to look for it. Mm -hmm. So I just want to keep adding that in. If you feel alone mm -hmm. and you're out there and you feel like you're just really struggling. You know, we mentioned isolation is a killer. Robbins mentioned that many people, Lori Mishley, just find it. It's there. And, and, you know, I also mentioned in the chat that one of the features of trauma is being fiercely independent. Don't Ding, forget to we ask. have a winner. <laughs> yeah, don't forget to ask. Right. <laughs> anyway, thanks for to keep in mind with what you're saying, Heather, about finding someone to talk to. Most of us are on the Davis Finney ambassador website page. So there's that avenue, but more so find somebody who is in your area uh, that's in the Davis Finney ambassador group and reach well, out to them or, or try other groups. But the more you can get in touch with people uh, that are going through the same thing you're going through and not be alone alone, uh, the better off you're going to be. And, and it's back to what Kat was saying, where, you know, the family are the people you choose. Uh, so. For sure. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll echo it again. Don't be afraid to ask. I, I, I get phone calls and emails all the time from, from people that are either newly diagnosed or just have questions or want to know more about uh, social security disability or what have you. And, and, and I, I love to help people like that. I, I really love to meet people like that, that, need the help and are willing to get asked for the help. And I can't be there, of course, for everybody, but, to, but if you ask me, I'm, I'm there, so. 
Kim. Yeah, let's not forget about support for our care providers. They yeah. need help and support too. Just like we need each other here in this chat to share ideas with and know that we're not alone. The care providers need help too. I used to tell my support group, pay for a massage for your care partner or get them to go out with a, a friend somewhere and do something special, total get away from Parkinson's and just give them that space and honor them with a, a special gift with it. That's the best mm -hmm. thing you can do. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Thank you. I uh, wanted to just uh, read a couple of things. Uh, Peter says, regardless of my PD, my wife and I have our own different interests and activities. Having our own space as well as doing lots together is so important. Great conversation, you guys. Um, let's see. PJ said, this group is awesome. Wish this session was longer than an hour or twice a month. Colleen, this has been great. Thank you. I so enjoy the group. Uh, Michael, this was wonderful as always. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, fantastic as always. So you guys are, you know, a real hit is, is what it comes down to. And really thank all of you for sharing today. I know these are um, not always easy subjects and sharing personal information, and it is just beyond valuable to, to everybody. So thank you so, so much for being here as always. Thanks everybody. You're fabulous. Thanks. Have a great thank month. You. We'll see you soon. And if you have questions, email me at blog at dpf.org. And if you have a suggestion for a topic, put it in there.